Before the mid 60s, Americans had never heard the term SUV, but the Ford Motor Company changed all that. In 1966, the new Bronco was an instant hit when it first rolled off the assembly line. Now, a group of craftsmen in this small shop is looking to rekindle that 50-year-old spark. They're bringing new life to an original Bronco and giving it modern-day technology underneath. Their mission? Make an American legend even better. Welcome to steamy Tulsa, Oklahoma. You know, just a few months ago, a local crew here in a small shop started out with only a 50-year-old hunk of steel. Well, their mission was to set out to create a vehicle that looks just like a 1966 Bronco, but drives just like a new sports car that can also go off-road. One of the biggest challenges of this project is shoehorning an enormous modern-day power plant into a truck designed before anyone could even imagine the kind of power and technology we have today. That's what's at the core of this Bronco build, modern technology in a vintage vehicle. The customer donated his authentic 1966 Bronco, which had seen better days, and the crew at Brand New Muscle Car set to work immediately. They made sure the antique body looked as good as new, patching and repairing any holes and imperfections. Okay. The original Bronco was a capable off-roader for its time, but technology had passed it by. Our Bronco got beefy new shocks and a suspension system that can handle the lifted vehicle and enormous tires. Seam seal was brushed on just like in the old days, and after that, the Bronco was ready for a beautiful coat of black paint. In our last episode, the crew made some modifications to the engine compartment to make room for the enormous engine and transmission combination. And now that it's in, there's the matter of wiring and plumbing and lots of small details. Also, I don't need hose clamps. Clamp tight has that covered, but I do need some caps. That size and that size. All right, back at it. David's the project manager, so in the end, you know, the goals he set are the goals I need to meet. And we go back and forth probably five, six, seven, eight times a day on how things are going on what particular car and make sure you know, the customer's goals are being met, the vision's staying the same. We kind of split the duty on parts. He does the bulk of the parts, and I order the specialty parts. Like if I need a set of headers, I'm the one that does the research, you know, find out what works best, order it. Or if literally, if we need to part right here, right now, can't wait on it, I'll take off and go to a local speed shop or parts store and get what we need. Thank you for calling O'Reilly's. This is Misty, how can I help you? Hey Misty, it's Richard down at Brand New Muscle Car. Hi. Hey, can you lay out a couple of gallons of antifreeze and a quart of brake fluid for me, please? Sure. Anything else? That's it. We'll see you here in a few. Alrighty. Thanks. Hey, Misty. Hey, Richard. Brake fluid and antifreeze, please. Yeah, I've got it ready for you right here. You guys look busy today. Yeah, we're pretty busy. It's that time of year, isn't it? Yeah, summer's always pretty busy. Awesome. Uh, paperwork. Yep, always got to have the paperwork. Oh, of course. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. See you later. Bye. Bye. It started for me when I was a kid. I just kind of gravitated towards it. Probably one of the biggest influences, my oldest cousin had a 69 Roadrunner 383 four-speed car. And I remember the first time I saw it, I was just like, holy cow. And I think I started my first job actually in the repair industry when I was 19 or 20. Started off doing brakes and suspension. Had to borrow tools. I didn't have my own tools. I've been lucky. I've worked for some really smart guys. Uh, and I've worked in a couple of shops that were really well run. So I learned the right way. I learned from somebody that had, that had already been doing it for 20 years and instead of figuring some of it out on my own, like much of it. The styling on this Bronco will reflect the original 1960s look with a modern twist. But some cars, well, they're just made to be left alone. In the world of restoration, nothing is more rare, more valuable than Mopar. And this car is really special. This is a one owner, 1970, 446 pack RT car. Husband had it since the very first day. He passed away and now the wife is restoring it for the son. The first time the son will drive it, 
will be after we finish restoring it. We're gonna make it look like brand new, put it all back to factory, completely stock. Personally, that's my favorite thing to do to a car. For us, it's a real honor to be trusted with a project like this with a family. We're just humbled to do it. So I'm a Mopar guy myself. I love Mopars. And a 70 Challenger 446 pack like this is one of the most iconic cars that was ever put out there. I mean, basically the most iconic Mopar is the Hemi and the 446 pack's gotta be right behind it. It was always a special car to me. I like the Challengers better than the Cudas personally. I mean, not everybody does, but I do, even though they're basically the same car. It's really cool for me to be working on a car that's this iconic. To me, this car is even cooler than a Yanko Camaro. So when I go to a car show, I might see a car that I really like, like say this Challenger at the show and really catches my eye. But most of the time when I'm at car shows, I'm not really looking at what kind of car it is per se. I might not even know what kind of car it is I'm looking at, but I'm looking at the quality of the paint, the bodywork that was done on it, the custom interior, any little detail that was done to that car to make it something special is what I'm noticing. And then after it's all done, if I really think I like that car, I might look and see what it was. There's still more brand new muscle car on the way. Up next, we check out one of the coolest Bronco restorations you'll ever see. And Richard and Omar get a little help from their friends before they fire up the engine. Brand new muscle car classic Bronco is brought to you by Rust Release, the safe industrial strength rust remover that works. Kicker Performance Audio, living loud. And by Tom's Bronco Parts, the largest inventory around of 66 to 77 for Bronco Parts and accessories. I bought it from a farmer in Lehigh, in Pennsylvania. It was a rusted out plow truck that had not been registered or off the property in over 20 years. And there were wasps in every hollow cavity. It was quite a mess. So that was a big learning experience for me. This is the first car I've ever restored. It was a bucket list thing. It will be much easier the next time. A lot of lessons learned along the way. I had a lot of help, actually. I'm smart enough to go to the people who know what they're doing for the different components. So it's not like I dropped off a shell of a car and came back two years later with my checkbook and picked it up. So I, I worked with body people when it got beyond my skill level. Bought a tub kit, had a hell of a time putting that thing together. But eventually the body came together, got a brand new V8 crate motor, nothing fancy added a few luxuries so it would be an everyday driver. The car has air conditioning, heated seats, power steering, power disc brakes, and then I went for every possible accessory. The tire racks, the roof racks, the chrome around the lights, all the jewelry. I had it painted professionally. I think they said that I had the most spray out samples done of any car that they've ever painted in the history. I think I did over 50 before I came up with this color. And then I still couldn't commit to the color, which is why the sides have the big Wimbledon white. I was inspired by a Bronco that I saw on the internet. Full on wood interior. I very carefully chose the leather colors and the cherry wood. And then I, um, I'm an archer, so I, hung my bow from the ceiling. I love the way it came out. Hey, Morgan. Morgan. Yeah. You need battery cable ends? Yes, sir. I'll go get them right now. And what battery are we using? Um, well, do you want to use a top post or a side post? Well, if we do a side post, we got to have it oriented correctly, don't we? Mm-hmm. If top post, then it's all like, like this. If it's side post, then you know what I'm saying? So you want a top post or side post? Whatever you want. Just get whatever you want. I'll be back. That one's backwards. You want to take a picture like that? You remember? No, I can remember that long. So battery and cable ends. What else? More coffee. I think they call that motor oil down at O'Reilly's. I'll see what I can do. Don't, don't forget the donut. Omar's a jokester. <laughs> He's always, always laughing. Actually, he kind of gets me out of bad moods sometimes. <laughs> always joking, always laughing. He typically takes a lighter heart at looking at some things, but he's a pretty steady guy. Yeah. 
crown crown on the equal ground. He's not that kind of guy that's got an ego where he goes, well, I don't need anybody. I'll figure this out. He's the kind of guy that's going to, you know, looks at something and goes, eh, I don't know. Maybe I ought to ask for another opinion, and he'll go get me. And I'm the same way, and that's why he and I get along real well. All right, just finished doing my wiring, now my gauges and my radio. Uh, now we're just going to put it on and see what it looks like. Okay, looks good. Now time to take it apart and set it to paint. When we come back, we learn how the Ford Bronco helped ignite the SUV revolution. And it's almost time to start this Bronco's new engine for the first time. You think it'll start? I got 100 here, says it won't. Oh, 100 says it won't. Learn more about the Ford Bronco story in Todd Zerker's new book. Get your copy of Ford Bronco, a history of Ford's legendary 4x4 at cartechbooks.com and at popular retailers in store and online. The utility market when the Bronco was introduced was about 40,000 vehicles per year. And that was spread across about five different vehicles, Jeep, Scout, Land Rover, Toyota Land Cruiser, and Nissan Patrol, I believe. And Ford sold over 20,000 Broncos in its first year of sales. So you see that the Bronco alone added 50% sales numbers to that market just in its first year alone. International Harvester and Jeep were small manufacturers out of the mainstream. All of a sudden, Ford's in, first of the big three manufacturers to bring this thing to market. People could say, okay, I can go to a Ford dealer now and get parts for my truck rather than trying to figure out if they had an International Harvester dealer nearby or if they could find a Jeep dealership. Due to the Bronco's success, then other manufacturers, most notably Chevrolet, took notice of that and then the market blossomed in the 70s. Meanwhile, Richard is back in familiar territory. Hey, Misty. Hey. Back once again. Of course. Yeah, seems like I'm done here all the time, huh? Yeah, it's your second home. <laughs> Oil filter and battery terminals. Filter and terminals. Anything else? Yep, that's it. Let me get you some paperwork. Thank you very much. You're welcome. See ya. See you later. Bye, Richard. Bye. Bye, Richard. Bye. A lot of people say, you know, it's a dream job. Dream and, and nightmare at the same time. Putting something together brand new isn't as easy as it sounds. Even though it says it's a bolt-on part in the box, it hardly ever does. For me, a trial run, putting it together, mock-up, whatever you want to call it, is just that. The first time you put it together, yeah, it might be okay and it might work. But the more I look at it, I think, well, can I make this better? Can I make it easier? You know, whatever I got to do. And, and that happens a lot. I'm going to go ahead and put a fuel pressure gauge on the fuel pressure regulator. That way we can double check it and make sure we're getting the right amount of fuel pressure coming up front. Should have about 55 to 58 PSI to make the engine run correctly. We'll put this on for now, and then once we get everything dialed in, we'll take it back off. When you're doing out of the ordinary things, like some of the things that we do around here, you might have to take two ordinary objects and put them together in an extraordinary way. So you have to find ways to make it work. That's what I like. I like coming to work and, and going, all right, how am I gonna make that work today? The guys here at Brand New Muscle Car can tell you the best way to work smarter is to make sure you have the right tool in the first place. One of the neatest little tools we've found and used is a tool called clamp type. You take the wire, you do the tool, it's very simple, and it makes the perfect little clamp. We can use it on builds, restorations, I mean really any automotive, doesn't even have to be automotive, you can use the thing on your lawnmower. It's just the cleverest little neat tool I've ever seen. The clamp tight tool is a very versatile tool. You can use it for just about anything you're putting a hose clamp on. Some of the best applications is actually your air hose in your shop, garden hoses around the house, battery cable fixes as well. It's a great emergency tool, your header wraps. One of the best applications for mariners or sailors is your dock lines, your ropes, or mousing your shekels. It's also great on those classic muscle cars where you have these classic tower clamps or the regular worm-fed clamps, which is actually what we're going to show you on the 55 Chevy here in a few minutes. In the meantime, I'm actually going to show you how the clamp actually works. You take your wire, you bring your ends together, and you make a loop. You feed your ends through your loop and pull it tight. Now I'm going to do that one more time, the exact same way around, right up through the center of the first one, just like so. Go through, make sure you're not crossed or twisted, you want a nice even seal. Now, 
we take the tool. Take the nose of the tool, push it right up underneath of the loop, then you wrap it up and around each of the pegs, and then twist it together like a bread tie. So we're locked in here. You're gonna start tightening it up. You'll feel it just like a regular worm-fed clamp. You feel it get nice and tight. So we're tight. We're gonna go ahead and flip that tool all the way over itself. Back that nut off. The tool pops away. At this point, you're gonna take a pair of cutters. About a quarter of an inch is all you need. And then once you press those down, that is your brand new 10 times stronger hose clamp. Better than those classic clamps. If you do want the classic clamp, you can take that hose clamp and just slide it over top. That way you have the new style clamp that works a lot better with still that classic look that belongs with this car. The Coyote engine, big engine, small space. That's why I've got the Clamp Tight Mini. It's really good in tight spaces. We're only gonna go 90 degrees when it's tight. You're gonna feel it too. The tool's gonna start getting a little tighter, but what I'm really looking for is it's nice and flush. So now I'm just gonna flip it over to there, take my cutters. We're gonna cut one side, and I gotta get over here and cut this other side, wherever you can get to it, because it is in that tight, tight space. So I'm just gonna push these down on both sides. And that's your custom hose clamp. Okay, fuel system's done. The last piece to the puzzle, Omar has the air intake tube with the mass airflow sensor. We're gonna put it on the throttle body, plug it up, and uh, we should be ready to start this thing up. Coming up, Troy's talent extends beyond cars and trucks. Plus, this coyote comes to life. Turn it on. Let's light this candle. Hit it. Brand new muscle car, Classic Bronco, is brought to you by Wild Horses 4x4. Isn't it time you answered the call of the wild? Rhino Hitch, the most versatile adjustable hitch on the market. And by No Limit Engineering. We build them, we drive them, and we test them. When you come through the doors at Brand New Muscle Car, you never know what you're going to find. Projects from the big to the small to the weird, you never know what you're going to get. One thing that's evident, these guys are not just automobile painters, they are artists. And that's reflected in the things they do when they're off the clock. I guess it probably started when I was a kid. Enjoyed drawing, sketching, stuff like that. Working on models, typical gateway stuff to art. I owned a car, decided it needed a paint job, so I did that and then started taking it in Votech in high school and stuff is where I got my start, actually. Started doing custom paint work and then got involved with custom artists, pinstripers, two different things is how I kind of started going this direction. I've kind of come into a, a market where we do, uh, I guess, garage art, house art. Probably the thing that sets me apart is be the panels that we use we hand cut them, we make them, put the borders and stuff on. So we start with decks that are just plain like the silver one and then we'll candy them a certain color, whatever color we decide, and then start doing the various kinds of artwork. Obviously people have different tastes. They like that kind of art versus the old traditional. A lot of people just like this because it's plain. They can pick certain colors out to match their interior, their house or their garage or, or just whatever. Really I have customers from all over the country they usually get a hold of me through the internet. Painting cars and stuff is your daily job, and then this is in the evening where you get to kind of relax. You do what you want, whatever color, whatever shape, whatever size. You know, there's no deadlines, no guidelines. You just kind of have fun and, and just go with it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds good. Okay, bye. Well, we're getting ready to do the engine start, and Brandon, Dustin, and Jared are at Exalta Paint School. They're getting their master paint certification, which is great but they're not here. So we're gonna have to dial them up on the iPad and see if we can get this engine to start. All right, that's it. Well, let's put some gas in this bucking Bronco and see what happens. All right, let's do that. There's no cooling system in this Bronco yet, so they can't run it for too long. Just a splash of gas and they're ready. Okay, we got the guys on the East Coast. We're getting ready to start the engine. You guys ready? Oh yeah! Let's do it. Has anybody got any money on it? Hey. Uh, oh, there it is. Get your money out. Do you think it'll start? I got 100 here says it won't. Oh, 100 says it won't. What do you guys think? 100 says it will. You guys got some money? I got 40 on it. Okay, all right. Richard, Omar, do your thing. Key on. 
I got no fuel leaks. Hit it. Ah, sounds mean. Yeah. What do you think? I can't wait to get back. Kathy won. I said that it was going to start. I said it was going to start. There. Somebody come get it. I mean, I. Woo! There you go. Come get it. <laughs> All right, guys. Go back to paint class. Learn something, would you? Thank you very much. Good work. Good work. Good work, boys. Good work. All right. See ya. There you go. Nice, man. Don't nice, fellas. Out. Next time on Brand New Muscle Car. You think this classic Bronco looks great on the outside? Just wait until you see the interior. Come back next week because you don't want to miss it. But I got a lotto ticket and a case of beer. Ford Bronco and a green John Deere. Loyal dog and an old guitar. A little moonshine in a mason jar. I got a pair of boots, worn out jeans. My own little garden with some beets and beans. Big front porch with a rocking chair. So much love that I can share. So why can't I write a country song?